Welcome back to the Fab Four Podcast. We're joined today by a very special guest, but we're also joined by our co-host, Scott Franklin, our host, Alec Williams, and myself, Ben Bertram. And Todd Polson cannot be present today. Um, we really don't have a good reason for that. And uh, But we're joined today by our, go- our guest, Mr. Jimmy Taylor. I'll let uh, Mr. Franklin uh, talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Ben. First of all, where's Todd? There's another tree on the ground for his father-in-law. He's got to move it or, you know, what are we doing? But let's get off the top. I, I, I'm privileged today to uh, introduce our guest, uh, just a little bit about Jimmy Taylor. Uh, he is uh, a former teammate of mine from like 1983, two, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, played four. high school, <laughs> three, four, whatever year it was, Jimmy. And uh, played basketball at Campbellsville High School. Uh, maybe played a little baseball at least one year there. Uh, somehow left Campbellsville High School and wound up at a, some college called Cerritos Junior College out in California, and then parlayed that into uh, a year at New Mexico State and finally finished up his career at the University of New Mexico as a Lobo. And uh, we're, we're glad to have him here, and we're going to let Jimmy kind of tell us a little bit about his journey, his basketball journey that started uh, as a sophomore, I suppose, at Campbellsville High School. Jimmy, it's great to have you on here, man. It's good to see you. And uh, tell th- these guys don't know you very well. I've told them a little mm-hmm. bit, and I know there's going to be people watching. A lot of people that's going to know you because they're old like we are. But some <laughs> of the young guys, they don't know uh, uh, about you and about uh, your journey as a basketball player and a person coming uh, out of Campbellsville High School. Sure, no problem. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, Scott and I were teammates uh, a couple years at Campbellsville. Uh, my dad was a teacher and a coach, and we moved to Campbellsville my sophomore year. So I was at uh, Campbellsville, 83, uh, 84, 84, 85, and 85, 86. Um, played three years at Campbellsville for Coach Carr, and we had some pretty good teams. Um, went to the regional finals our senior year and lost to E-Town. Uh, after that, uh, like Scott said, I uh, really didn't have much coming out of high school. Um, not a big demand for six foot two. 135 pound slow point guards at the college level. And uh, so I got a, an opportunity to go out to Los Angeles and play a week of summer league at that time. Uh, California junior colleges were having, I mean, you could just play a ton of games year round. We had spring leagues, we had summer leagues, and then you had your regular season. And so I went out and played a week of summer league and coach Bogdanovich, my, my junior college coach and Jerry Hernandez, the assistant coach, they, they liked the way I played. So I went out and played two years at Cerritos and then went to New Mexico State for a year and uh, played for Neil McCarthy, who eventually got kicked out of basketball, transferred up to University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, played uh, and graduated with Luke Longley, the number seven pick in the 91 draft. And Luke ended up winning three championships with the Bulls and uh, also played for another coach up there, Dave Bliss, who was the head coach at Baylor when the one player shot and killed the other player, Showtime or Cinemax did the whole special on it. So I, I'm, it's probably unique. I'm one of uh, – probably the only person in NCAA history to play for two coaches at the D1 level that got, both got kicked out of basketball. So – and that's kind of <laughs> how uh, my journey went, I guess. Scott, you want to start off with questions? Jimmy, you know, I, I can remember a lot of things, but uh... – how in the world, though, did you decide to go to Los Angeles, California? Just, I mean, there's a lot of junior colleges in Illinois, and there was even some in Kentucky back at that time. Right. Uh, why, why and how did you get to California? Dad had worked, as, as you know, and you ended up working at Arizona's camp. Dad worked at Arizona's basketball camp in the summer, and I actually went out there and played one year. And between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college was when Tommy Tolbert had signed with University of New Mexico. And so Coach Olson was close with Coach B, sent me out to go out and play, like I said, a week of summer league out there. Coach B said, we'd like for you to come out. And I didn't have anything else. Uh, as you know, Coach Carr was trying to get all of us to go to Erskine or Land or wherever it was, the NAIA school down in, uh, down in South Carolina. I wanted to play, my dream was to play major college basketball. And if I had gone NAIA right out of, right out of uh, Campbellsville. I could have gone to Georgetown, some other places, um, but I wanted to take the opportunity or take the chance, I guess I should say. And I went out to Cerritos. Um, at that time, the South Coast Conference uh, was Cerritos, Compton, Long Beach, Fullerton, Pasadena, Mount Sac, uh, and Golden West. We were probably 
one of the top 10 best junior college conferences in the country uh, at that time. Um, so I got to play against a lot of good players, got the exposure, but I just, I was able to take the opportunity, take advantage of it and give myself an opportunity to then go on and play D1. Jimmy, um, like, a, like Scott was saying, I didn't, I've heard your name before a couple of times and stuff, but I really didn't know you a lot until Scott sent us some things a couple of weeks ago about you. Uh, what was one of your biggest memories, best memories of your time at Campbellsville High School? Actually, I loved playing at Campbellsville. Um, we, had, we had a really good group. Uh, we were really good our last two years. I think we were like 48 and 16. I know we were 26 and 5 uh, our senior year. Uh, getting beat in the regional finals, uh, you know, was, was heartbreaking. And Campbellsville still, I think the last time Campbellsville won the region was in like 73. Uh, one of the best memories, I guess I could say, or one of the, the best accomplishments, I think our last two years, we beat four or five teams that actually won their region. Um, so we beat Johnson Central in the Wayne County Tournament. We beat Metcalf County in the SKC Championship game. Uh, we beat Somerset um, back when Tony Massey, who ended up playing football at UK, was there. Uh, and then we also came up here and beat Scott Droud and his Highlands team. And uh, our senior year, Droud actually led the, led the state in scoring about 35, uh, 34, 35 points a game before the three-point line. Um, so just we had a great group of people, um, and we, we had some really good teams. So we just had a lot of, a lot of big victories, I guess I could say. Jimmy, so, on, um, on, add on to that, ahead. Jimmy, uh, that Scott Droud went to Vanderbilt. Scott Droud went to Vanderbilt, and uh, when we came in our freshman year, a lot of people, younger people don't realize, the three-point line didn't come in until my freshman year of college. So now when you see basketball, everybody uses the three-point line. Everybody shoots a lot of threes. It's in your offense, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't like that back when we came out of high school in the first you know, four or five years of the three-point line. When Droud graduated from Vanderbilt, I think he was the all-time leading three-point shooter in Vanderbilt history and I think he's still in the top uh top 10 as well so yeah he and Rex was our senior year as well so he beat Rex as far as the scoring champion for for the state at that time and we came up here and beat them beat them by one point in the Lloyd tournament so that was a big win for us Dan all right so I'm um, I'm looking through here and I, I see that you uh were coached by Dave Bliss and you you mentioned a little bit in your introduction about uh, the scandal and the Showtime documentary and, and disgrace and everything. Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about um, what it was like playing under a coach and what that whole scenario played out as, as a player? Yeah, actually uh, playing at that level, D1, um, it's really interesting because it's so pressure packed. Everybody's under so much pressure. Um, coach Bliss was a different character. Um, he was not real personable. We saw Coach Bliss at uh, practice, at games, and at film sessions. That's pretty much uh, about it. There again, we had a good group of guys. Luke obviously was the was the uh, the number seven pick and gets all the the publicity. But also played with a guy by the name of Rob uh, Rob Robbins, and Rob led the nation in free throw percentage my redshirt year at uh, UNM in his uh, junior year, which would have been uh, 89-90. So we had good teams. Um, playing in the pit, obviously the pit's one of the best basketball arenas in the country. Uh, we did make it to the NCAA tournament. Um, we lost to Eddie Sutton's uh, first year, first team at Oklahoma State. Uh, but we did get to go back and play in old Cole Fieldhouse uh, on the campus of the University of Maryland, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun too. Because you walk in and, you know, you're thinking about all the great ACC players like Jordan and Perkins and Worthy and David Thompson and Lenny Bias, all those guys who come through there. Uh, so playing D1, um, it was an interesting experience. Playing for Coach Bliss uh, was different. Um, I'll tell you this story. Uh, when everything went down in Baylor, uh, the Albuquerque paper called and asked me, and uh, they wanted to get some quotes and stuff about uh, the scandal, what was going on, did we know people were getting money at UNM, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I was treading lightly, but I did give the guy a quote. And I, I told the guy, I said, uh, I said, yeah, we, we knew that people were getting paid. Um, we had guys that would show up on campus. They had nothing. And then all of a sudden, a couple months later, they've got $500 jackets that they're running around with. So we knew stuff was going on. But I was living my dream. I got to play, you know, major college basketball, play D1 basketball. 
Um, so when the documentary came out, uh, some of the stuff that was kind of said, some of the things that happened um, were not a total shock, I guess I should say. So I've got a, I've got a follow-up question on that. You mentioned about guys coming in on campus, uh, not having much and leaving with all their uh, things that came out of nowhere. So I, I'm sure you've kept up with the whole Zion Williamson case and right. going into Duke right after that, his parents bought a half a million dollar home. Uh, do you see – do you see similarities there? Has that, has that, in your opinion, been going on for a while now? And it's just kind of been coming on the spotlight? Or what's going on there, in your opinion? It's, yeah, I, I think it's been going on for decades. Um, I think AAU has exacerbated it. Um, everybody that's involved with AAU is trying to get a coaching job. They're trying to get money. They're trying to get this. They're trying to get that. Uh, there was always rumors, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s about guys yeah. getting money. Uh, my senior year was 90, 91 at UNM and, you know, UNM was by no means, uh, you know, a big boy or a big player. Uh, so the stuff that's flying around in the top schools, there's, there's no telling how much money's flying around and what's going on. And it's not just basketball. It's, it's all the big revenue producing sports. So yeah, there's, there's stuff going on. Jimmy, Jimmy uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Alec. I'm, no, go ahead, Alec. I got a million questions I can ask Jimmy. You all right. <laughs> um, like you said earlier, you co or you played against um, Oklahoma State, who was coached by Eddie Sutton back um, whenever that was, like back in the early 90s. 90s. Yep. Yeah. Um, who was the toughest matchup you had in your time in college, high school, whatever? Um, D1, I played against Tim Hardaway. Um, so Tim Hardaway was obviously – I don't know if he's in the Hall of Fame, but I, I think he is. He was obviously really good. That team that they had at UTEP also had Antonio Davis on it. Um, so they were, they were really good. The Bear was still uh, the coach there. Um, so I would say from a guard standpoint that Tim Hardaway was probably the best player that I ever played against. Also played against Cedric Sabalos, who had a, a really good pro career, was a scorer. Um, he ended up winning the dunk contest one year. We actually played California Juco ball at the same time. We didn't play against each other. But uh, he was at Ventura when I was at Cerritos. And then I played against him when he was at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, so Cedric was really good. Antonio Davis was really good. Tim Hardaway was really good. Um, it was interesting. We played against Sean Bradley, who uh, I think he was the number two pick one year. Um, I was always a Philly fan growing up, and I could not believe they were drafting him that high because I knew he was not going to be a good pro. Um, so got to play against some guys that, uh, that were really good. Tim Bro and Reggie Slater at Wyoming ended up playing some pro ball. They weren't big names, uh, but I would say that uh, that playing against Tim Hardaway was probably the best player that uh, you know that I ended up playing against. How many points did you hold him to that day? <laughs> <laughs> I think he had about 20, 22, something like that. He Hardaway was good, and a lot of people don't realize he's not very big as far. He's only about six foot tall but he's just solid muscle. He's just so thick. So he's about six foot tall and about 200 pounds of muscle. And he was really strong with the ball. Um, wasn't a great shooter. Um, obviously improved the shooting once he got to the pros, but he could really get to the hole. He could really finish. Um, and then, like I said, he had Antonio Davis playing with him. And then Greg Foster came off of uh, a transfer a year. So they ended up having three guys on that team that had good pro careers as well. Jimmy, uh, coming out of junior college, obviously we know you you first went to New Mexico State. What other schools did you go visit or look at that, that you considered going to coming out of JUCO? My first scholarship offer was Santa Clara, um, which is Steve Nash's uh, alma mater up in the Bay Area. They were the first one um, to offer me a scholarship. Um, they offered me uh, – I went up for a visit in preseason. They wanted me to sign early. I didn't want to sign early. My other visits were uh, the University of Colorado. Um, a guy by the name of Tom Miller was the coach there who was a Bobby Knight disciple. Um, beautiful campus, but I just didn't want to play in that system. Clem actually had me come up to Minnesota um, for a visit as well, and then New Mexico State, and I ended up signing at New Mexico State. Um, had a couple of other opportunities. Um, when uh, Tim Floyd was the head coach at Idaho, um, they wanted me to come up for a visit up there. I, I told them, I said, look, you know, I know you guys have a great program. He had taken Idaho to the NCAA a couple of times. He had the UTEP connections. My uncle played at UTEP for the Bear, so that. But I told him, I said, look, I don't want to go to the big sky and freeze to death all year long. 
And that was the year that he got the New Orleans job. So as soon as he got the New Orleans job, they called me, wanted me to come for a visit there. But I had already committed to, uh, to New Mexico State. And then also McNeese State um, had offered me a visit. Uh, Cal State Fullerton offered me a scholarship, but I just didn't want to stay in, uh, in California. Uh, so, you know, New Mexico still had the good weather, the sunshine every day, uh, nice arena, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, that's, that's how I ended up at New Mexico State. So rewind a little bit. So back in your get back in your playing days at Campbellsville, what was it? Uh, was there a big rivalry with Toe County still? What was it like playing Toe County? Yeah, it was it was still a big rivalry. Um, my freshman year, I was at Barron County. I wasn't at Campbellsville, but that's the year that Taylor County beat Campbellsville in the regional championship over at Nelson County. And uh, I think, and Scott might know this, but I think they played five or six times that year. Um, they were obviously the two best teams in the region and they would, Campbellsville would win one game and Taylor County would win the next game. Um, so that was, uh, it was still a big rivalry. My sophomore year, they were a lot better than us. Um, they had Doug Roots and they had Wingler and they had McQuarrie. Um, they had Phil Cunningham. They were, they were a lot better than us. And then my junior year, um, they beat us a couple of times during the season. Then we beat them in the first round of the district. And at that time, there was no seeding. So we drew each other. I had to play in the first round of the district down at Adair County. And it was, uh, it was a big crowd down there, standing room only. Okay. And, then, uh, and then my senior year, kind of the roles kind of reversed. We were, we were a little bit better than what they were. Um, and so we, we beat them a couple times my, my senior year. But, yes, it was – at that time, it was still, you know, a big rivalry. And, unfortunately, now with the way that college – or college, the way that high school sports are, there's just – people don't go to games like they used to. And uh, I don't know if it's because, you know, basketball is not as good as it used to be. You know, there's kids are on their cell phones. There's cable TV. There's all kinds of variables. Um, but at that time in the mid 80s, it was still a big rivalry. And there were still a lot of people that would go to uh, to games. Jimmy's right. I believe that year Taylor and Camelsville played like five times, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe split them. I think Camelsville won the district championship. Yep. But then lost the regional final by two points. I think Kerry Cox made a layup at the uh, close to the budget, just with right. seconds left. Uh, probably the two greatest atmospheres, and, and Jimmy wasn't there for that one. That was un unbelievable over at Nelson County. Uh, you can imagine uh, Taylor County Camels are playing in a game like that. And then the game over to Derrick County, the first round of the district against Taylor. And uh, Taylor had two really good players, and Doug Wingler and uh, Phil Cunningham. And it was a great atmosphere there, too. I think Jimmy made like seven straight free throws to, in the fourth <laughs> quarter in that one to, to seal the deal. But it was a great robbery back then, fellas. It's a lot different than it is now and a lot of mutual respect, and the teams are very good on both sides. Uh, just, to, just to elaborate on Alec and Ben, uh, Jimmy, how many players from my graduating class, your graduating class, and the one below you actually had an opportunity to go to a college basketball program? Doesn't matter what level. From Campbellsville yeah. or in the region? Just Campbellsville. Just to show you how many people on – the team yeah. were, were pretty good players. Right. Well, actually, you know, your, your sophomore year, obviously Boogie and Darnell were both, uh, were both really good. And Darnell played some small college ball. I don't know if Boogie uh, ended up playing. Um, Eric Anderson ended up going to, to K-State and playing up there for a couple of years. Um, I think Eric e was one of the top rebounders in the state our senior year, or my junior year, his senior year. Um, so Eric, he played uh, some small college ball. I think Little Red went to St. Catherine uh, for a little while. Uh, and then with my class, um, Anthony ended up graduating from Cumberland College. Um, Darwin had a chance to go to Sullivan. Uh, and then I ended up going to, to, uh, to play out at Cerritos. And then Greg Arbett had some opportunities, kind of the same thing, going in AIA. Um, really didn't, you know, he really didn't like it that much. Uh, and then Eric Newsom as well. I forgot about, uh, I forgot about Eric. Um, so... And I don't know if you guys remember Kevin Ellery. Do you, are you guys familiar with Kevin Ellery at all from Washington County? No. Uh, no, okay. I don't think I've ever heard yeah, of him. Yeah, Kevin Ellery was really good. Um, he was, a, he was a, a class behind me. He ended up playing at Notre Dame. And he was about 6'5". Uh, about and back in, uh, you know, 85, 86, people didn't get a lot of dunks. And Scott can attest to this. Eric Newsom could really, could really get up and dunk. I think our senior year, he had about 10, 11 dunks in high school, which was a lot back then. And Kevin was really good. Like I said, he ended up having a really good career playing for Digger Phelps up at, uh, up at Notre Dame. 
and we were playing over at Campbellsville one night, and uh, that's back when Whitey Simpson was the head coach at Washington County. And so Whitey, they had all these athletes, and they'd sit back in this 2-3 zone, and they'd always play this 2-3 zone. And so we kept throwing the ball to Eric in the high post, and they weren't gardening. And so we kept telling Eric, dunk the ball, Eric, dunk the ball. And so after a few possessions, he turned around, and Kevin Ellery did not come out out from underneath the basket. And Eric took one dribble and cocked back and tomahawked right on top of Kelvin Ellery's head. So it was, uh, it was really funny back then. Like I said, not a lot of people got dunks back then, but, um, you know, Kevin was a really good player. I think he's still down in the area, um, down in that area somewhere, but he was a good player at Notre Dame. Like I said, he played for Digger Phelps up there. Jimmy, um, what do you think's the biggest difference in high school basketball from when you played in the late 80s to now? I don't know how much high school basketball you watch now. But. Right, right. I think it's a lot different. Um, you know, when I was playing, people wanted to slow the game down. They wanted to play 2-3 zone. Uh, we didn't have the three-point line. Um, but I would make the argument um, that back at all levels, not just high school, but high school, college, and pros back in, in the 80s, guys were more skilled. Guys were better ball handlers. They were better passers. Um, they were better, you know, now the three-point line, everybody's just taking threes. Um, but I would take, you know, the guys back then shooting the ball against anybody today. I think guys understood the game a lot better. Um, now with AAU ball, obviously AAU has just glorified all-star games. Um, so that's kind of where everything has gone. There's not a whole lot of uh, emphasis on high school basketball the way it used to be. Um, now all the recruiting's done at the AAU tournaments in the summer. Um, whereas back when we were coming through, all the college coaches – at, were at games. They had to go to high school games and watch guys play. So I would say that the uh, just the skill level, the way it is now, the way basketball is now, it's pretty much ball screen and penetrate and then kick for a three. There's not a whole lot of, uh, lot of offense being run. Um, so I would say that that's the big difference. It's become maybe a little bit more athletic, um, but uh, I would say the skill level and the understanding of the game was a lot better back in the 80s than it is now. Do you think skill level has declined, like, from back when you were playing to now? Yeah, I, I think that now, I mean, if you watch basketball now, it's either somebody trying to get all the way to the hole and dunk or they're just kicking for a three. And, and that's kind of – that's just kind of the way it is. And, and like I said, I think that back in that area, there were a lot of people that could beat you with their brain. There was a lot more basketball savvy um, across the board uh, than there is now. Do you uh, – you played in a oh, game – sorry. Go, go ahead, you, man, my bad. You played, in, you played in a game, I think 100, 139 points were scored. You guys scored. <laughs> so, what was – you mentioned, like, nowadays it's, you know, ball screen kick out for a three. What was your game plan when your coach is sitting you down in the huddle and you end up scoring 139 points? What was the, what was the attack that game? Yeah, that, that was an interesting game. It was a preseason uh, game – at UNM, and obviously when I was at UNM, Bliss based everything around Luke. He knew that Luke was uh, going to bring all the attention. He knew Luke was going to be a top 10 pick. So we pounded the ball inside. Um, but for that game, we got out in front of him. We did a lot of running, and we had a lot of athletes. Um, when I was at UNM, we had a lot of guys that could really play and get out on the break and score. And it was just kind of one of those snowball effects. You get a little bit of a lead, everybody gets to feeling good. And then before you know it, you're just pounding somebody and then everybody's hitting shots, everybody's coming off the bench and scoring and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know if it was a set game plan, um, but it was just one of those games where, where we played really, really well. And not that it was – I can't remember who it was against, but it wasn't against, you know, a top-10 team or anything like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, 139 points back then is a lot of points. Hey, Jimmy, you mentioned playing with Luke Longley. I know everybody's kind of knows that guy, especially after the Michael Jordan uh, – documentary on uh, on ESPN yeah. what uh what what can you tell us about playing with a guy like Luke Longley uh, you got any funny stories about Luke and do you have any communication with Luke Longley since you've been out of college I haven't talked to him in a while um the first couple of years he was at Minnesota I went up and he got me some tickets up at uh Washington in Indianapolis uh play against the Pacers um so I haven't talked to him probably since the the late 90s um probably Luke was a really interesting character. He was from Perth, Australia, which is on the far western coast of Australia. And evidently, that's, it's a beautiful place. It's right on the ocean. 
Um, it's warm weather. Luke never really liked being in the U.S. Um, basketball, obviously, he was making millions and millions of dollars. He was a great guy to be around. Um, I think – now, I, I don't know, um, but – I think he probably passed on the documentary. Um, I, I probably think that if they reached out to him, he was probably like, yeah, nah. Very laid back, um, extremely intelligent. I think Luke got like 11 or 1200 on the SAT. He was going to be an architect. And then after his first year or two at UNM, he figured out he was going to make millions and millions of dollars. So he got out of the architecture program, just took some, uh, some normal classes. He was great to hang around with. He was great. He was a great teammate. You know, like I said, Bliss, you know, based everything around him. But Bliss was really hard on Luke. He kicked Luke out of practice, you know, a couple of times, um, would scream and yell at him because Luke was, was – was, he was really laid back. He was easy going, um, and he didn't get fired up about much. He had great skills. He was a great ball handler as far as for a 7-2 guy. He could step out on the floor, make good passes, had the European style where he could step out and, and shoot the jumper um, as well. I think probably one of the funniest stories – and I don't know this firsthand. This is coming secondhand. But I don't know if you guys remember when uh, the Lakers were looking for Phil Jackson, the second time they were trying to bring him back to coach. And Luke and Phil Jackson are very tight. They're really good friends. They spend time together in the offseason and that kind of stuff. So Rob Robbins tells the story that when they couldn't find Luke or they couldn't find Phil Jackson, Jenny Buss and Dr. Buss and all them were calling and everything – that Luke and Phil Jackson were on Luke's yacht in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Perth, and Phil Jackson didn't want to talk to anybody. So for like three days, they couldn't find him. And then finally, he, you know, Luke's like, it's Dr. Buss again, or it's Jenny Buss again, or something like that. And he's like, okay, give me the phone. And so then he talks to him, and that's when they flew him back, and he came back and went for the second stint with, uh, with the Lakers. So that's a, that's a funny Luke story, and I can see – I can see that happening. I know why Phil Jackson being kind of a hippie, Luke being kind of a hippie, why they kind of meshed and are still tight. Um, so that, that was, a, that was a, a Luke story that I could see happening as well. Um, Frankie, Ben, do you have any final questions for Jimmy? I've got one final more thing. Uh, go, go ahead, ahead Frankie. Ben. You, tell your, no, you go ahead to ask your question right. and I'll give Jimmy right. the stat. <laughs> okay, it's it's a pretty quick question. So I, I, I feel like I know your answer. Um, so obviously, in recent uh, times, the, the debate has been brought up again of LeBron versus MJ. Yeah. You played with Luke Longley, who played with MJ, uh, had a lot of success with him. Um, and you also said that you think guys are a little more skilled back then, a little more knowledge of the game. So who, who do you think is better, LeBron or MJ? I would say Michael. I would say MJ. Um, you know, LeBron is is unbelievable. He's uh, – I mean, who would have ever thought Cleveland was going to win a, a, a world championship, let alone they've gone to the NBA – would they go to the NBA Finals three or four times when he was there? He won a couple down in Miami. Now, obviously, this year they were really good. Um, so, I would not take anything away from LeBron. But I would say that, that Michael Jordan is probably um, – you know, and I was never a big Jordan fan. Um, but I would say that Michael Jordan is probably – the best player um, to ever play. I guess you could probably make an argument for Kareem um, since Kareem won multiple championships, was the all-time leading scorer, kind of, those kind of things. Um, and Oscar Robertson, since Oscar Robertson was uh, the one that was the first one to average, I guess, the triple-double, that kind of stuff. But I would have to go, if you're going to build a team and you're giving me either LeBron or Michael Jordan, I would go with Jordan. But that's my personal opinion. Obviously, you can make a great case for LeBron as well. Jimmy, you're just old like me, and you won't give in to LeBron James. I'm with Michael, too. But that, <laughs> that's just an arguing point between old people and young people, I think. Hey, I'm, Jimmy, I'm actually just, on your side here. I'm, a, I'm an injured guy. That's, that's because your dad has told you, you about it. <laughs> no, that's because I'm a Bulls fan. Simply because I'm a Bulls fan. True. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I've already told this before, but uh, there's only been five people to ever play an NCAA tournament game here out of Tedder County. Clem Haskins was first. Marion Haskins was second. Ken Hatcher was third out of Western Kentucky. Uh, you were fourth, and Quentin Gooden was fifth. To my knowledge, those are the only five people to ever play an NCAA tournament game out of Tedder County, Campbellsville, uh, in the history of, of playing basketball right. around here. 
Yeah, I, I think I think uh, you're right. I, I think got, I am the only player from Campbellsville High School to play yes. in the NCAA tournament. Also played in the NIT too. So, um, see, I didn't remember that. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, my junior year we played in the NIT. Played Tommy Lewis and those guys from Pepperdine. All right, Jimmy. So I got one more question for Alec. Goes with our little uh, trivia stuff or our, right. our our poll thing here today. So who was the guy from Vegas? that Robbie Dermott and I watched dunk on you oh, at about 1 a.m. our time uh, when you played against Stacy Augman and those guys from Vegas. Yeah, that never happened, but uh, we did we play watched Vegas. It, guys. I watched it with my He didn't eyes. watch it. They, Vegas was loaded at that time. That's back when uh, Tark was the head coach there. Uh, it was the year before they won the national championship, so it was before the year before Larry Johnson, before he came to Vegas. And their starting five was Greg Anthony, uh, who had a good pro career and is an announcer now. Um, Anderson Hunt was at the two out of Detroit, who was really good. Stacy Ogman was the three. Um, and Stacy Ogman played a lot of pro ball and is still an assistant coach, I think, in the NBA. And then they had uh, two 6'10", long, lanky, athletic guys, um, David Butler. And I can't remember, Ack George Ackles, I think. One was from New York City and one was from uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and then they had Moses Scurry coming off the bench. So back then, um, my junior year, we played Vegas three times. Um, obviously, they beat us by about 17 in the Thomas and Mack. They beat us by two um, at New Mexico State. And then in the conference championship game, they beat us by six. Um, but they were loaded. Um, you talk about athletic. Um, they, you know, Chase Greg Anthony around Anderson Hunt and Stacey Ogman and those guys. That was uh that was a really athletic team, but they never dunked on me. That's a that's a fallacy. We watched it. Robbie Durham and I it's about one a.m. because <laughs> their 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 game started at midnight our time, so we'd come yeah. to our house and watch Jimmy play. And it was I think you guys played a one three one zone for some stupid reason. You were on the baseline. Right the side. Yeah, whatever we, uh, it was, you wound up on the baseline and got hammered on. I remember that was that was uh <laughs> that was the old USA Network we were on. And uh, I, th this is an interesting story. I'll tell this real quick. My senior year, we were playing uh, Tennessee on ESPN. And that's when Allen Houston was at Tennessee, and uh, his, his dad, Wade, was the, the head coach. And Jimmy Valvano was still alive, and he was still – he was doing games for ESPN. So, obviously, New Mexico, or NC State had won the national championship game in the pit. So, all the reporters were at our shoot-around and everything, waiting for Jimmy V to show up. So, he comes walking down the ramp at the pit – comes down on the floor, walks out into the middle of, uh, of half court, gets down on his hands and knees and kisses mid court of the pit. And so the pictures, all the reporters are taking pictures. And on the next day, on the, all the covers of the paper were Jimmy V kissing the floor at the pit. But Jimmy V was really cool. He stayed around after our shoot around, after uh, we had our practice, our shoot around. He was talking to us, he was telling us stories. So when you see Jimmy V on video, being the life of the party. That's exactly how he was. He took his national championship ring off and gave it to us. And he was telling us stories about Thurl Bailey and, and the tournament and all that kind of stuff. So I got to meet, uh, I got to meet Jimmy V uh, through them doing our, our ESPN game. And then you guys probably won't uh, remember Terry Holland, but Terry Holland was a great coach at the University of Virginia. He had uh, Lamp and Raker from uh, Kentucky, uh, one from Louisville, one from, uh, one from Ballard, one from Apollo. Uh, Jeff Jones went out and played for him with Ralph Sampson. They actually went to the Final Four, and we were playing at Colorado State, and uh, he was doing our ESPN game. So I got to meet uh, Terry Holland as well. So you get to meet, you know, you got to meet some uh, some interesting coaches. And then also uh, when I was at Cerritos, uh, Ben Hallen was the assistant coach at UC Santa Barbara under Jerry Pym. And Coach Hallen is a Cerritos guy. He went to Cerritos High School. He was from Cerritos. He loved Coach B, uh, my junior college coach. So he was at our practices all, all the time. And now, obviously, Coach Holland has had a very successful career, and he's now the, the head coach down at Mississippi State. So uh, I, I met Coach Holland and talked to Coach Holland quite a bit when I was at Cerritos. Great story. Um, all right, Larry, we're going to give our Sweet 16 brackets a day off, Ben and Frankie. and But we're going to start a new segment today. Ben, do you want to – Kind of give a little info on our new segment. All right, yeah, I guess so. So we Since it was we, your we, idea. Were, we were just we were just brainstorming, and I thought of maybe we could do a top ten or something. We all give our top ten. So I thought a steak. I was eating a steak at the time, so I was like, "Wow, what would be my top ten steaks?" And then I was like, "Well, ten's too much. 
So we went with five. So we're going to do our top five steakhouses. And uh, I guess we'll let our guests go first, Mr. Taylor. Um, I would say Jeff Ruby's or the precinct over in Cincinnati would be one. Um, Ye old Steakhouse down in Knoxville. Uh, if you get a chance, if you're down in Knoxville, definitely go to uh, Ye old Steakhouse. Um, I would say State Line um, Barbecue out in, uh, in El Paso. Um, probably the Quarters in Albuquerque. And uh, then I can do my own steak as well. I can make a, a really good steak myself. So those would be my top five. Frankie, you want to go next? Yeah, I don't know if I can come with five, Alec. Uh, <laughs> you know, Tony's in Lexington is awful good. Uh, Malone's in Lexington is very good. It's waiting uh, on it. Really good. I, I, you know, uh, I don't eat that much steak out. I usually get something different because I usually grill steaks at home, which is number three. Uh, here at the house I really enjoy that you know I, I like steak everywhere but I don't get it that much but if I had to pick my top ones I would have to go with Tony's and Malone's those are my two favorite ones Ben you want to go or you want me to go you go ahead all right I'm gonna go at number five Cattleman Steakhouse uh number four I'm gonna go um Rosewood Country Club over in Lebanon. Wow. Wow. Really good that's, just, that's an upset right there. <laughs> <laughs> if you have not had it, you need to try it. I like Rosewood. Uh, yes. Um, number three. Ro Rosewood's our new sponsor, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they would like to sponsor just good call, man. messages or something. We'll get that worked out. We'll be <laughs> glad to come over there and do a show and eat or something. We can do something. We can figure a something meet out. meet and greet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, Corona, we can't do that. Yeah. Um, number three would have to be Shades Cafe and Steakhouse in Dudleyville, Bell County. Oh. We went down there for last year for the region – or the – what was that, the semi-state? Semi-state. Went down there. A little hole-in-the-wall restaurant, but it was good, I'd have to say. Um, number two would be Texas Roadhouse. Pretty good one. Um, and then – my number one's got to be Malone's. Can't beat it. Ben. I'm just right, ben. I'm surprised that you got a Bell County Steakhouse and a Marion County, <laughs> County Steakhouse. That's guys, Port Kentucky. I mean, people, that just man, that just surprises me. All right, I I, I liked, like like repping the home state and everything. So, all right, well, I'll start out with number one because that makes it easier. Um, I'm gonna have to go with Montgomery Inn Boathouse in Cincinnati. Um, number two, uh, gotta be Malone's. It's hard to beat. Hard to beat a good Malone steak. Um, three would be Jay Alexander's, also in Lexington. Four, um, Blue Heron Steakhouse. I don't know if it's a steakhouse, but it's Blue Heron something, also in Lexington. Uh, and then five. Is Garcia's. Garcia. I, I, a lot of people. I've heard. A lot of a lot of people don't know. I think Garcia's has the best steaks in Campbellsville. <laughs> ben, I've heard. I've heard a lot of people say that the two best places to get steak in Campbellsville is the Bowling Alley and Garcia's. That's what I I've believe heard. it. I've done. I've done neither, but that's what I've heard. I'm with you, Frank. I have not. <laughs> have to try Give me a try next time. time. Ben, if you like Montgomery Inn, you got to try Jeff Ruby's. There's one. I've, all, I've actually been wanting to try Ruby's, but yeah. I haven't got around to it. Now, that's pricey. So, yeah. you know, yeah. one person is going to cost you about 80 bucks. So, yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll go solo. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's good, though. And then, do you grill steaks? Uh, I've maybe done it once or twice. Okay, well, you can buy his seasoning. That's what I use on mine. So, mm -hmm. I go over to the precinct and I buy his seasoning, and then you can put it on your steaks. Got it. I'll try that out sometime. All right, guys, we got anything, any final thoughts, questions, or anything for Jimmy? We'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Rosewood <laughs> Golf Club, Garcia's, and Jeff Ruby Steakhouse. Exactly. That's all. Absolutely. Good call. <laughs> One thing I will tell you guys, too, when I was at uh, New Mexico, Rick Majerus was the head coach at Utah. So I got to play against Majerus as well before, uh, before he passed away. And obviously – he was the head coach at Utah when Kentucky beat them in the national championship game. And was that 95, 96, 97, somewhere along in there? 
98? Was six, it 98? It's either six or eight. Yeah. No, it was eight. It was eight because six was against Syracuse. Right, right. Seven, so I seven they got beat by Arizona, cheaters. Yeah, so I got to play against the Bear, who's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. I got to play against Rick Majerus, who was in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And I got to play against Tark, who was in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Cool. All right, well, that's all the time we have for you today. Uh, we'd like to thank Jimmy for coming on the show today as a guest. And uh, Amber, everyone for listening and watching the podcast on our various apps that we're on, Anchor, Apple Podcast, Facebook, and YouTube just to name a few. Um, if you haven't already, please give us a like and a follow on the, our social media accounts. We'll be back on Thursday with a pretty big guest, I'd have to say, Frankie. He's, it's pretty big. You say he's going to be on here, but I've heard <laughs> stories before from you and Ben, and it hadn't happened yet. So, But I think he'll show up. I do. Kentucky Sports Radio's Ryan Lemon will be on the show on Thursday. You will not want to miss it. But until then, this has been the Fab Four Podcast.